chance to start again Breathing hopes of peace, of light of love You can't tell me that there's nothing left to do. You can't tell me that there's nothing left in you. Cause I still believe the world can live it through. All these pain and grief, there's always hope to hold on to.
Throughout history, many people have dared to do different things. To go against the tide, to speak out, and to change the course of history. To dare means to be brave enough to do something. To dare is to be aware of the wounds of the society. To dare is to take action. In this United World Week 2021, we want to dare to care. That is why, from May 1 to 9, we will build a global network of fraternal actions that put care at the center. Yes, it will be a global network. Because beyond physical and cultural borders, we know that caring is universal value, and that building a more fraternal world is possible. Many physical and digital events will take place. Some will be local initiatives, others global. People from all over the world will be connected and you will be able to join in wherever you are. What matters is that every event and every person who joins has enough strength to build a more united world. By learning, acting, and sharing. And you, what do you dare to care of? Care. Proteger. Zabota. Reaia. Conversão. Ter atenção. Sorque traga. Minha isso. Cuidar. Aruga. Cura. to all of you thank you so much for spending some of your sunday afternoon with us for those here in europe and africa uh, your evening with us in asia and your morning with us in the americas my name is christina guarda i am 31 and for the last six i have been a regional councillor for the european green party in veneto a region uh, of the northeast of italy Today, we have an amazing panel and on CARE and COP26, where we will be talking about how our choice of taking care of the other might influence and shape the result of COP26, the largest international summit about climate negotiation that will be hosted in Great Britain in November. And we will be talking about it with some special guests. Dr. Lorna Gold, Chair of the Global Catholic Mo Climate Movement, 
Prof. Simon Borg, Ambassador of Climate Action in Malta, and Pasquale Ferrara, Italian in, in envoy in Libya. I know you can't wait to start, but before we dive into panel introduction, I want to take the temperature of the, of the room. Are you ready for this wonderful afternoon that we are going to spend together? Let us know in the YouTube chat or those joining here on Zoom. What do you expect from today's panel? Write your thoughts and questions of, uh, for our guests in the comments and chats below the video. That's awesome. So let's start. start. This is the next phase of Dare to Care campaign launched earlier today, focusing on our, on, on, on our people, planet and our ecological conversion. One of the strengths of this campaign, Take Care to Impact, looks at how communities and individuals all around the world can make a societal impact in caring for the planet. You know, I told you before that I live in one of the most incredible regions of Italy. In Veneto, there is Venice, Verona, the Dolomiti Mountains, Lake Garda, and other splendid cities and towns, hills, and natural areas that makes me proud to work as a politician, having, first of all, an ecological target. But sadly, I am also one of the almost 500,000 people that has blood poisoned because of the greatest case of water pollution in Italy and Europe by an, an artificial chemical compost named, named perfluoroalkyl substances. The consequences are really bad for our health, in particular for our children and women, and for our land, our agriculture and biodiversity. That's why I want that all politicians, entrepreneurs, citizens choose the environment as cornerstone of uh, all their choices and actions. Because no family, no business, nothing can have a long life in a land that's uh, hostile because of pollution or overuse of the natural resources, overbuilding or decline of biodiversity. So that's why we cannot take care of the other, the real mission of a politician, without daring to care uh, in our ecological actions. That's why I'm really honored to have the, the privilege to introduce our first guest. Please welcome with a virtual clap, Ambassador Pasquale Ferrara, Italian Special Envoy to Libya. Pasquale is a, car a career dipl uh, diplomat uh, and uh, has until recently the Italian uh, Ambassador to Algeria. He has uh, previously held uh, other diplomatic posts in Santiago, Athens, Brussels, and Washington, as well as a position at the uh, Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the European University Institute in Florence. Ambassador Ferrara, thank you for being with us and helping us answer this very important question. Where has climate politics and diplomacy come over the last few years? Where is it now? And where is it going beyond COP26? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for uh, having me. Uh, I will try to summarize a very difficult uh, subject uh, from uh, a point of view uh, of, uh, uh, first of all, a diplomat, but also as a citizen concerned uh, as you are about uh, uh, climate uh, change. I will use some uh, slides in order to be more uh, straightforward in my uh, presentation, if you allow me. So uh, just a minute. Um, okay. Okay, here we are. So first and foremost, uh, uh, why we have to care, I mean, in terms of international relations and world affairs about uh, uh, climate change. Because 
climate change is a, a phenomenon that is uh, multi-dimensional. Uh, we can say that is uh, uh, the greatest threat confronting uh, human uh, humanity today. Uh, it has devastating effects, not only for the environment, of course, but also for peace and security, human rights, health, and uh, uh, these effects have already been felt uh, across uh, the planet. We can say that uh, climate change is a sort of uh, multiplier of existing injustices at global level and uh, uh, as a tendency to amplify conflicts to further uh, undermine fundamental human rights such as the right to food, uh, food security for instance, water, shelter, education and health and also the right to dignity and to life itself. So uh, where we are in terms of international relation and climate diplomacy um, on um, this issue. So I would say that uh, regardless of the different stages that we have been witnessing in the last decades about the climate uh, diplomacy, there are at least three or four, let's say, dates that are really important for us. The first one is 1992. Uh, when in Rio uh, a, a major summit uh, took place, the Heart Summit, uh, and during this summit, uh, uh, a convention, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed, and, and uh, alongside with a convention on biological diversity, a declaration of principles on the forest management, and, uh, and there was a commitment to convene uh, um, conference of the party, which is the meaning of COP, uh, every uh, three, four years. And uh, the first of this conference took place in 1995. Um, the other turning point of climate diplomacy took place in, in Kyoto in 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was signed. And this was the first uh, uh, case where, let's say, nation took um, a quasi-legal commitment to uh, reduce uh, emission. Uh, but then uh, after a few years, this uh, protocol uh, revealed uh, insufficient to deal with uh, uh, the global transformation in terms of climate change. And uh, we uh, had the very successful conference in Paris in 2015, COP26. Um, I would summarize a few elements of this conference because it's, it's really important. Uh, first, uh, uh, everybody agreed in this conference to, to join uh, uh, efforts to keep uh, average temperature well below uh, 2% and possibly uh, not uh, uh, beyond 1.5 uh, uh, degrees centigrade if possible. Uh, the objective was to uh, level off greenhouse gas emission as soon as possible, but also politically from the point of view of the international relation, it was agreed the principle that there is a difference between developing countries that struggle to find their own way to prosperity and developed countries that uh, I'm afraid are the most responsible for uh, pollution uh, in terms of uh, uh, emission. Uh, our mechanism was uh, uh, agreed uh, on a voluntary basis, but also uh, this is a, a very important political commitment that cannot be disregarded. Uh, the, 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 the instrument uh, was called intended nationally determined contribution. Uh, that, that is, each and every country decides by itself what kind of commitment it would take, but then it uh, can be uh, taken accountable for this uh, commitment on the global scene. Uh, and then uh, an important mechanism of financing uh, uh, was agreed, uh, uh, rich uh, countries uh, agreed to contribute uh, to a fund uh, um, uh, with uh, one, uh, 100 billion uh, per year. Um, and then a new mechanism was also uh, uh, created uh, to deal with loss and damages. We will see in a while what uh, this uh, means. Uh, loss and damages, let's take an example. In, in, uh, in Sahel, in, in Africa, there is a lake. Uh, we can say also that unfortunately there was a lake because La Lake Chad uh, lost uh, uh, almost 90% of his water 
from 1962. And this is an important lake for four countries, Niger, Chad, uh, Nigeria, and Cameroon. And this uh, provoked not only poverty, but also instability, also migration. So climate refugees is a new uh, phenomenon now that we have to deal uh, with. Um, climate change uh, uh, re response range from uh, uh, adaptation. That means uh, that we need to be prepared in the short term to cope with the effects of climate change. Um, uh, then mitigation, it's uh, uh, another measure, measure that uh, uh, regards, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, improving our uh, ability to control emissions. So, but uh, by definition, it is a long-term uh, um, commitment. And then loss and damages, as we already uh, said. Now, um, this is the traditional way of dealing with climate change in international relations, but I think this is not enough because instead of talking about climate change and this technical definition, adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, we have to talk of climate justice. So uh, it's not only about uh, trying to make something, but it's about international justice. And uh, what, what, what do we mean by uh, international uh, injustice related to climate change? That those who uh, bear the worst effect, uh, so the developing countries, contribute to this problem uh, least because they uh, cannot be compared to develop, developed country in terms of uh, emission. Second, those who contribute most, the, uh, devel the developed country, are best placed to adapt. Why? Because they, uh, they have the resources, the technology, all the capabilities to deal with that. And then uh, vulnerability uh, is another element of injustice because in, in, in a way uh, cut across nations. So uh, poor people, um, uh, women, young people, unemployed people uh, are much uh, uh, more exposed to the effect of climate change because of uh, uh, jobs that they, they, they lose and also effects on uh, uh, their social uh, uh, life and perspective. Uh, finally, there is a, this, uh, this idea that we, we can talk uh, uh, and we can improve resilience in the South, in the global South, let's say, but this should not be an alibi to say, okay, since climate change is there, there's nothing we can do, so we help people to resist and to organize themselves. Uh, and because this shifts the burden of climate change towards the develop, developing uh, uh, countries. So uh, global, uh, global uh, uh, climate change is a, a crisis of global justice. And we should never forget uh, this um, uh, because instead of talking about a technical mechanism, we should uh, take into account another element, which is very important, which is transformation of our model in terms of uh, economy, in terms of uh, interest, in terms of uh, uh, the structure of our society and the structure of, of the uh, production. Uh, then uh, we, uh, this is the very core message that we get from the pandemic, for instance. Care and climate, uh, care work and climate work are connected. First and foremost, and foremost because uh, preventing um, the, the disease by uh, taking care of the environment is also a way of uh, uh, taking care of people. And also people that work on the ground, taking care of the uh, of the people that are affected by uh, several diseases, not only the COVID-19, are also people much more uh, ready to accept that any alteration of, uh, of the environment uh, can uh, be a disaster in terms of uh, health, in terms of uh, life, in terms of quality of life in our uh, society. Uh, finally, what we can expect from uh, uh, COP26, so the Conference of the Party uh, 26. Uh, I think that it is a moment to raise the uh, ambition, first and foremost, in terms of the uh, commitment taken by uh, states 
So this idea of uh, uh, really, really aiming at uh, reducing by 50% uh, the global emission by 2030. Um, then we uh, expect that the countries uh, would uh, uh, set an example uh, for the, uh, the global uh, emitters, let's say, the, that are responsible for 70% of global emissions, China, the United States, India, Russia, Japan, UK, and, uh, and European Union, of course. Um, then there is a need not to uh, separate uh, the different aspects of climate change, mitigation from one side, adaptation on the, on the other side, uh, since the only strategy that really work uh, should uh, have in mind a more com comprehensive vision of uh, economic and social transformation. A just transition means uh, taking into account what we said before, that uh, climate change is a matter of uh, social justice too. And then to take the lead we can expect from this country on uh, solidarity between rich and poor uh, countries. And uh, finally, uh, to, strike, uh, to strike a, a, um, a deal between different alliances uh, between the, the less vulnerable and the more vulnerable uh, countries. So the response should be normative from one side, and visionary if you, if you like, but also uh, empirically focused uh, with regards to concrete measure that can alleviate the burden of uh, uh, climate change. And I would uh, uh, end this presentation by recalling a wonderful speech that the UN Secretary General Guterres uh, gave at the beginning of this uh, year uh, about uh, the need uh, to govern the global uh, commons. He spoke about uh, the need uh, for a, a reset in terms of global governance for the 21st cen century, the need to reinforce and reimagine governance of critical common uh, goods, uh, critical uh, global commons, uh, like uh, um, public health, but also peace and natural environment. Uh, multilateralism, uh, this idea of cooperation among nations should be much more uh, networked, put, putting together all the, all the agencies and institutions uh, also uh, expressions of civil society that can make the difference. Uh, a new global deal among countries uh, uh, is needed to ensure that power, benefits, and opportunities are shared more broadly uh, and fairly across the, the world, giving the, the developing countries a larger voice in the global decision-making. And then you, young people, uh, you should be at the table, but not uh, as recipient or discussant of a uh, decision already taken by elders or official representative, but as uh, a designers of your own future, because there is nothing like uh, uh, climate change that concern the future of, of the youth. Um, so all in all, the conclusion of the UN Secretary General, and I entirely agree uh, with his approach, uh, strengthening global governance to deliver global public goods is possible and it should happen now. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Pasquale. Thank you, because you explained well as the connection between social justice and environment commitments and uh, the new political approach uh, to govern the common good. So, now I am really happy to introduce our second guest today, Professor Simon Borg, Ambassador for Climate Action in Malta, Chair of Post-COVID Strategy Steering Group Malta. Thank you for being here with us and Professor Borg, please, can you give us the, uh, the negotiation uh, perspective about COP26? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Good. So, um, thank you very much, Christina. I am very excited to be with you. I thank um, the Ambassador Pasquale Ferrari for his uh, very thought provoking set of slides, and I will continue uh, building up on what he was saying. 
Um, and we'll focus a bit more on the Paris Agreement because it is really uh, the, 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 the most recent agreement and the one that needs to be sustained and strengthened in the years to come if we really want to fight climate change. Uh, and the Paris Agreement, at least from my point of view as a negotiator, I've been involved in climate negotiations for around 30 years, right from the very beginning. Um, and uh, it has been quite a journey. It is, has been also a very, very challenging issue that international negotiators didn't have uh, anything to do with something similar before. And we have seen how there, little by little, a bridge has been built between scientific information, law and politics. And this bridge, which is still being constructed, if we look at it figuratively, is, um, is the solution for our planet, if we really want it to survive this, this very serious threat. Why am I saying this? Because the Paris Agreement signals a, gives us a very important message. The age of fossil fuels is over. And uh, a little bit before Paris, in the meeting, in another meeting of the Conference of the Parties, another COP in Copenhagen, which is considered to be quite an unsuccessful COP. But that COP, we agreed that if we really wanted to address the climate change in a very um, head on, we need to agree that we cannot allow the temperature of the planet to increase by more than two degrees. Later on, this target was revised to preferably 1.5 degrees increase, only 1.5 degrees increase by the end of the century. If it goes beyond that increase, then unfortunately it will be the point of no return. And as a result, to reach this target in Paris, all the negotiating parties, all the states that were there, which were practically all of them that are members of the UN, um, agreed that they had to ensure that as soon as possible, emissions of greenhouse gases would peak, would be capped, and then by 2050, we achieve carbon neutrality. As Ambassador Ferraro was saying, industrialized nations that have been for a very long time generating emissions have to take the lead. But the difference between the Paris Agreement and the other agreements before it, the Treaty of 1992 and the Kyoto Protocol, was that this time, all states had to reduce their emissions, cap their emissions eventually, and then reduce them to be able, so that globally we can actually reach carbon neutrality. And this was a very important step ahead because for many years, the distinction between those countries that had to control their emissions, reduce them, and those that didn't have to do anything was a very contentious problem. Uh, but the, the developed countries had the obligation to reduce, the developing ones did not have the, this obligation, which is fair in a way, but what was happening was that some developing countries had become the biggest emitters, because over 30 years, many of them developed very, very fast. So it was agreed that everybody had to reduce their emissions. So you had to allow for flexibility. And this was very important to get also the um, approval and the agreement of all states. It was also very sensitive to certain political complexities, um, like the distinction between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party in the US, that one was always in favor of climate change, one was not, so they made it very fast and, and uh, um, agreed to call it an agreement rather than a treaty. Uh, to avoid complications. There were also the emerging economies that had to be given the chance to you know, continue in their, in their growth, but at the same time with a vision to reduce emissions. And ultimately, it was an exercise, a very long exercise of building solidarity, trust, and looking at the problem as a matter of common concern, okay? This was essential because 
um, how do we translate solidarity, trust, and acting for a common concern in the treaty? The treaty provides for the need of transparent accounting rules so that whatever we do, whatever all countries do, would be actually visible and measurable. Now, as you can imagine, whenever you get states negotiating a treaty, you get a representative, a cohort of people, a small delegation, okay? Something like 30 people, 50 people, some in the smaller delegation, smaller countries would have three or four. And these people are negotiating a treaty on behalf of their country. So with them, they have the concerns of their country, okay? So they are very much uh, influenced by their national requirements. And these national requirements would mean expenses involved, um, jobs, sa saving jobs, opportunities of progress for their people. So it's very much each person that negotiates the treaty representing the states brings with it this baggage. And to balance these national interests, it's very, very difficult. But with solidarity, trust, and agreeing that climate needs to be addressed, we managed to have an agreement that aims to serve as a catalyst for national developments. Because in the end, agreeing on a treaty requires us to go back home and make the change at home. Otherwise, things would remain very airy-fairy. And so the success of the Paris Agreement depended upon the, its potential to act as a catalyst, okay, for countries to go back home and reduce their emissions to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. It also became a trend setter. A setter, a trend setter in the sense that the age of fossil fuels is over. Now we're going for decarbonization. This is the outlook towards the future. It is not a perfect agreement. As we have heard, nationally determined contributions are the commitment that each country put on the table in Paris. The national determined contribution, as the name implies, means that each country was free to bring to the table whatever it wanted to bring. There was no imposition from above, you have to reduce by 5%. If, say, Malta wanted to reduce its emissions by 5%, um, this is what it got on the table. It could have gone, it could have been more ambitious, but Nationally, it was determined that we could go for this particular target. So in a way, it might be the lowest common denominator rather than the highest one can contribute. And uh, in a way, uh, in fact, the reality is that if we look at what the countries put together on the table under the Paris Agreement, we're nowhere near halting the temperature of the planet to 1.5 degrees. With what we have today, we will allow an increase of 2.7 to 3.5 degrees Celsius. So we really need to be more ambitious. There were other shortcomings. You heard Ambassador Ferrara mention the finance package. It was a very ambitious finance package at the time. The mobilization of 100 billion a year, 100 billion US dollars a year. This seems a lot of money. But first of all, notice the word mobilizing. It's not donation. It's making financial um, uh, measures possible. Secondly, the, it is, although there is this mention, it is a political mention. It's not enshrined in the treaty. It's not legally binding. It's the, the finance part is still very weak in the treaty. And uh, it does not also cover um, the aspect of adaptation. So, because adaptation is going to cost much more than the transfer of technology. Now, there are also, however, um, uh, various um, issues that remain very contentious, like the aspect of loss and damage. Developing countries, especially the most vulnerable countries, which happen to be the poorer countries, are the ones that will be worse hit. These include um, the small island states, but also countries in Africa, 
in Asia, Southeast Asia, that will suffer a lot as a result of climate change. And they will be having suffering more loss and damage. But the developed countries never wanted to accept there would be some form of direct compensation. They were ready to donate money to mobilize finance, but in a in a in a way as not as a historic obligation, an obligation because they were the ones that generated the emissions, but more as a means of assisting these countries. So the compromise in the Paris Agreement came out that it will be a text on loss and damage, but it has no mention of compensation and liability. And there are some positive points, like, for example, stock taking and review. What, the, what do these two terms mean? That the Paris Agreement is under constant review. It is not something that was done in 2015 and is static, but every so often, there would be a stock taking exercise to see that we are on track. And with this, we link to review, reviewing the nationally determined contributions to make them more ambitious to meet the carbon neutrality goal by 2050. Because if we don't meet that goal, then we're not going to, by the end of the century, save the planet from increasing its temperature to not more than 1.5 degrees. Also in the treaty, which is very important, are obligations that there should be transparency for this review in order to ensure that the contributions made are real. And every year, the every five years, the contributions have to be revised and they cannot backslide. They cannot be lower than they were. They can only increase. Now, we are at a moment, a very important moment in time, COP26, which was supposed to be held last year, is that crucial five-year period of review. It didn't happen because of COVID. Now all attention is for this year in Glasgow. And there is a lot of activity going on right now, especially as President Biden took office to really work hard on increasing ambition, to be able to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase um, target. So the Paris Agreement is very flexible. It is not the end, but the beginning of a process. And this is how we should look at it. Its effectiveness is very, very much dependent whether we can sustain this momentum and drive it into a political force. Because once you have that, then you have the motivation to generate green technology, to have the private sector interested to get as many uh, investors as possible in making the transition. We've seen, um, and this was the beauty of the Paris Agreement, that a large number of states got together, they call themselves the High Ambition Coalition. And contrary to the usual way we do things in international negotiations, it was the small island states that were the ones that really, really pushed for the momentum. Then you have some various developed countries, even the least developed countries, and the EU. And you had also China and the USA and even Japan involved and supporting this high ambition coalition. This was just before Paris. As you all know, then what happened was that the US withdrew uh, with, from the, the Paris Agreement and Thankfully, now it's back on board and back on board really, really with a vengeance because it's really driving the momentum very hardly. Now to start looking at what we can do, both as negotiators, but negotiators depend very much on civil society because civil society is the, is, is the powerhouse for uh, the politicians to listen to. The more vociferous the, the civil society is, the more likely the politicians are going to understand that people want change. So first of all, we cannot afford to be pessimistic, but realistic. And the Paris Agreement, contrary to what the press sometimes says, is not a series of voluntary promises. It is a legally binding agreement. The fact that the 
the contributions are voluntary because it's what the states decided themselves to put on the table. But once they put those on the table, those have become legally binding upon the states. They have to reduce and they cannot go back to their commitment. They can only go higher. Can they go back on the promise? You might tell me, well, didn't the US withdraw from the treaty? Yes, they can. Can they agree, can they be legally bound, but then not do so on a national level? Yes, they can. But then this is the way things work in the world, unfortunately. I mean, even as a citizens, sometimes we do not always obey the law, but that doesn't mean that the law is wrong. So what is the better option? Is there a better option from concluding treaties? Is it simply a question of blah, blah, blah? I think it is very disrespectful to look at the Paris Agreement simply as a talk show. Because in reality, in the real world, you have to coexist in this manner. Negotiating treaties is the only way to get states together. It's the only way to push for change. And what we had in COP21 in Paris needs to be supported rather than ridiculed. And the important thing is that we look bluntly at things and say, we need to be much more ambitious. And sometimes the change comes in very, very subtly. If you look at Paris, which was hailed as a great achievement, it didn't bring change overnight, but it definitely set the trend for an, an interest in green technology more than ever before. And you have the private sector driving change, even when the US withdrew from the treaty, from the agreement. I would compare it to what happened in the conferences of 1972 in Stockholm and 1992 in Rio. They were Im immensely important as trendsetters. They changed the way of thinking, the mindset. They did not bring an, a miracle overnight, but they definitely helped to change things for the better. So what not to do? So with Paris, we need to avoid the morning after syndrome. I've already spoken about, unfortunately, the withdrawal of the US. We wasted four years because of that, because it brought about a lot of reluctance to go on. Um, but you have also um, the immediate uh, return to the Paris Agreement uh, from the US. But at the meantime, we have the pandemic. A lot of states are saying now we have to focus on recovery from the pandemic because we, our economy is really at a standstill, etc. So we can't do any changes right now. On the contrary, COVID has presented a unique opportunity to build back better. Never before were we provided with this golden opportunity to change the way we were doing things. What do we need to do? We need to keep on pressing our politicians to be more ambitious in making the change, in making the national determined contributions more significant in order to reach the target that the Paris Agreement set. We need also to really help with mobilizing finance to, to help especially the most vulnerable countries and peoples. To conclude, the commitment to bind states legally is a matter in the end of goodwill and leadership. And this is where we need to help politicians to be good leaders. And although we are working with scientific uncertainties, because despite all the science, many, many gaps in the science still exist. And this is where skeptical politicians very often, um, you know, point to. But in the end, Phasing away fossil fuels is really for the benefit of us all because it will give us cleaner air, cleaner resources, um, investing in renewables, which do not cost money, but they are they are regenerate themselves, etc. It is a remarkable process when you think about it. The Paris Agreement was a moment where the big boys, so as to say, of politics, the big states could have walked away. They would have said, well, we don't want to bother about the small islands that are drowning. We want to keep ahead, go ahead and keep our 
economy is doing well and earning a lot of money, etc. But they didn't do that because they were influenced very much by civil society, NGOs, and especially the younger generation. And I do like to play this card a lot. When I try to convince any of my ministers to be more ambitious, I always make a reference to their children, their grandchildren, that they, it is an opportunity to give them a better life. So this, together with the realities that science was presenting us with, the impetus of the civil society, and also the pressure, the, 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 um, the kind of activity that civil society, uh, driven by the younger generation, was presenting, leads to this increased momentum. We had to have a realistic conclusion. Um, we look at the Paris Agreement um, as this link between politics, science, economics, technology, which should render this imperfect agreement better and better still. It needs to be revised and made even better than it was originally in 2015. Technology, again, scientific information, independent scientific information, are the life buoys that have given the planet and future generations some hope. It is a crucial first step, the Paris Agreement, but it depends very much whom we pass it on to. And if we, if we really look at what we're trying to do, it's a big feat, really, a really big feat. I myself have asked, how can we possibly think that as humans, we can actually control and you know, tamper with the, with the planet, with the climate, uh, the temperature of the planet? Isn't it presumptuous on our part? Well, but we have been presented with this challenge. And so we have to rise to the occasion. And the only way we can do this is to recognize that we have to work together and uh, we cannot afford to make any mistakes because we are running out of time. We have to simply to roll up our sleeves, dig our hands in the dirt instead of shrugging and walking the away because we feel the problem is too large. And when we look back at history, there have been many moments in the history of humankind where everything seemed impossible to deal with, uh, where problems seemed too large and too great, where the effects of, 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 of wars and, and problems were too immense. But those politicians and those people that decided to act, to react to these challenges instead of walking away, they were the ones who wrote history. They dared to care. And this is what we're doing today. So with this, I conclude my intervention and really wish that one day you as young generations will reap the benefits of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. We, uh, we thank you really, really for this great perspective, and in particular for the learning from the past part, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it was really, really remarkable. So last but not least, Dr. Lorna Gold is the author of Climate Generation, Awakening to Our Children's Future. She works uh, for Faith Invest and uh, is chair of the Global Catholic Climate Movement. So really thank you to be here with us and I have a great uh, question for you, Lorna, and it is what role can activists, communities play uh, all around the world in the lead up to and during COP26? Thanks, Christina, and thank you to Simone and Pascali for the wonderful overview and outline of what is uh, at stake when it comes to COP26 in Glasgow this year, which also happens to be my home city. So I'm really excited that the COP is going to Glasgow. History is weighing very heavily on the shoulders of governments that will gather in Glasgow to chart out how we're going to tackle climate change as we emerge from this pandemic. Key decisions and promises that were made in Paris that have already been outlined by Simone and Pascali, so I, I, in the interest of time, I won't go into them all again. 
but they need to be turned now into actions. Action is what matters at this stage. Reaching positive outcomes on against a backdrop of the, a world that's reeling from the pandemic could seem overwhelming. How can we think of the future when our lives have been turned upside down by what is happening in this real and present crisis? We who live in the wealthy global north, moreover, with relative ease to vaccines, could be tempted to forget that the pandemic is not over. It is far from over. In fact, in the face of what seems today like a vaccine apartheid, some, including camp campaigner Greta Thunberg, have said that the COP in Glasgow should not take place. How can it go ahead when most of the world cannot get vaccinated? And some even cannot countries cannot be represented at the COP. And even if the government officials could be uh, represented, how can their civil society be represented adequately in Glasgow? We've already spoken of climate change as an issue of justice. And one of the key things when it comes to justice is being able to represent yourself and speak in international negotiations. So ahead of Glasgow, the question of vaccines is also critically important. In the face of the climate crisis and the pandemic, we could feel like giving up. Yet I'm joined to the words of Pope Francis in his wonderful book, Let Us Dream. And to quote Pope Francis, we know that one does not emerge from a crisis the same. We emerge either better or worse. We need to ensure that the environment is cleaner, purer, than, and that it is conserved. We must care for nature so that nature can care for us. This is a deepening crisis for sure, but Pope Francis reminds us that moments of crisis can also be turning points. They can be kairos if we want them to be, and if we work towards building a new future. In fact, the motto of the COVID Commission set up by Pope Francis is to prepare the future. And there are very many positive signs that this new future is happening in the midst of this crisis. It is why the COP in November is just so important and the verdict on its success is very much in the balance. The pandemic has changed the public and the political mood globally. And when it comes to tackling climate change, that is fundamental. Firstly, the climate, the COVID crisis is teaching society and politicians in particular, a very brutal lesson. Facts matter, science matters, facts have consequences. If the pandemic has taught society one thing that it is that we need to pay heed to what the scientific community is telling us. Those that have ignored the warnings or delayed, delayed to act on COVID have paid a very sorry price. Those who acted early, who took signs seriously, have for the most part been spared the worst ravages of the pandemic. And when it comes to climate change, this it is clear that scientists have been warning us for decades about the impacts of inaction and rising emissions. And those figures that Simone quoted of us being on track at the moment to 2.7 degrees Celsius to 3.5 degrees Celsius in climate uh, temperature rise uh, globally, are not a safe future for our children. And we need to reflect on that, that the ambition currently being um, implemented by our governments or promised even is nowhere near enough. Can we continue to ignore 
what scientists are saying about the consequences of our inaction. The second lesson that the pandemic is teaching us is perhaps a more hopeful one, that collective action is not only possible, it's what saves us. It's only through concerted collective action, collaboration, cooperation, in other words, a culture of mutual and universal care, that lives have been spared. And we all know what this feels like and looks like now. Where market forces, on the other hand, have been left to just work things out, where society has been weakened and has each has been there for themselves, outcomes have been very poor. And similarly, when it comes to tackling climate action, there's now a really strong sense, that momentum that Simone also mentioned, that we must first and foremost focus on solving the problem together, not on saving the economy. The economy will recover, the economy will adapt, and in fact, it's already doing so. The third lesson and final lesson that I wanted to mention is that human health and planetary health are intimately interconnected. The stark truth is that the continued destruction of our ecosystems accelerated by climate change will inevitably lead to a sicker planet, a sicker human population and more pandemics. We cannot solve the global health crisis we now face in the long term without moving to a more sustainable zero carbon future. It must become our driving goal now to build that resilient future through lowering emissions and protecting nature. These lessons, as I said, are changing the global context in the run up to COP26. The discourse is not so much about whether the economy will move to becoming more sustainable, but about the pace of change. And this is a truly exciting moment in climate action. Technological breakthroughs are happening at breakneck speed. The financial system is adapting to tackle climate change in meaningful and quite radical ways. But as we move forward, we need to ensure that change is not simply a green gloss on a bad model. Deep change is needed. And as already mentioned, as things speed up, we need to ensure that human rights of the most vulnerable and especially indigenous peoples are not trampled on in the rush to green energy, for example. So what can all of us do? I would like to propose two things that we can each do. The first is to recognise, as both Pascali and Ms. Simone have said, that the outcome of COPs are an aggregation of national decisions, or in the EU's case, and the EU acting as a bloc. It's critically important in the coming months that we each engage with our own governments. There are many campaign groups already out there in existence, including the climate strikers. We need to join them, sign petitions, join virtual protests, write to our politicians, phone them up. We need to make clear that we want ambitious action in Glasgow, ambitions worthy of future generations. The Global Catholic Climate Movement, which I chair at the moment, will be launching a global petition during Laudato Sea Week and will be calling on everyone across the world to sign and promote uh, ambitious action. The second thing to, find, to conclude that we can all do is to focus on reducing the emissions of our own communities, however those communities are. Individual change we know matters, but collective change at all levels is most powerful. There are many initiatives now supporting the race to zero um, in every country of the world. One initiative I'm in leading at the moment is to encourage faith communities to make seven year transition plans to reduce their emissions and to go green. 
Faith communities make up 80% of the world's population. That doesn't count for nothing. Just imagine what would happen if those 80% of people uh, joined a race to make all the mosques, synagogues, churches, dioceses sustainable and carbon neutral. To date, over 100 faith leaders have pledged to join this massive global campaign, and I hope you can all join too. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you really much for uh, remembering us, uh, us uh, that uh, science and facts really matter and have consequences, and we have to tell uh, this message to all politicians and uh, all the people around us uh, so supporting the groups that are uh, that are uh, part in this uh, action. So really, really thank you. And I want to thank you and uh, our excellent panelists and the other excellent panelists for their participation. Sadly, we don't have any more time and we will uh, have time for more discussion in the weeks and months ahead. So uh, we'll uh, see, uh, see you soon, hopefully in person and not virtually. And now at the end, I want to tell you an important message. Yesterday, some of you might have the chance to attend the webinar, a vaccine for all, the common good our world needs to know. As the Dare to Care campaign continues, we will continue to turn this commitment to global vaccine equity into action. And we will work at the advocacy level to ensure access to uh, vaccine across the borders. But we also want to do our part to help concretely. To do this, we want to support communities in the Amazon who are being served by the Pope Francis Hospital Boat. These communities don't have means to get to urban centers for vaccine or support. And so we would like to support these initiatives with vaccine and other therapies. This, is, this has been an initiative that we've been talking about throughout this, this United World Week. Many of you have been working on this and for this reason, we thank you for that a lot. We'll meet again on the 20th May at 1 p.m. Central European time to present this campaign and we'll stream in unitedworldproject.org as we have been throughout United World Week. It's a chance to show our commitment to global vaccine access and healthcare as a global common good. And right now on the United World Project channels, we have to launch uh, the launch of the Accessible and Environments Inclusive Societies Initiative. So see you there and thank you for joining us here. Take care and see you soon.